clouds and recording should be starting now. So hi, Philip. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Welcome to this uh, interview about your business initiative that you're starting up. I'm uh, very excited to be able to talk to you about that and uh, to see how it connects to project management, because we're here with the Project Management Institute Luxembourg uh, chapter uh, team uh, to talk to you. So, um, so I would just say, uh, talk to us about what is your business initiative, which is called Our Choice Fashion, if I understand you correctly. Um, I'm very, very curious to, uh, to hear more about it because you were recently, uh, a couple of months ago, you, were, uh, you won a prize in a contest in Luxembourg, which is when I came, um, came across your initiative. Um, and we believe with PMI that um, sustainability is something extremely important in uh, today's world. So we uh, see that as a strategic goal to support. So I'm really happy to have found with uh, your initiative, the very first sustainability targets that we can uh, start talking about in Luxembourg. So let us hear us all about it. Um, uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, yeah, honored. Uh to be here and to, uh, to have this discussion with you. I also agree, you know, it's, it's so very important that we do talk about sustainability and, and, and circularity because that, that is how we can make things happen. So my sto story started on the, on the Swedish West Coast. So I'm a native Swede. I've been in Luxembourg for a few years. Um, and I remember being six or seven years old, uh, looking at the waves and feeling so inspired and thinking that I want to explore the world and I want to meet as many cool people as possible. And uh, I'm so blessed because I get to do that today. Uh, but our summers were also about cleaning up um, plastic. So plastic from, from our beaches because the current will, yeah, will take a lot of waste um, to our beaches, unfortunately. So that was my, my light bulb moment um, because after a few years, you're just like, well, what is all this talk about and, and where's the action? Um, mm -hmm. And paired with, of course, my love for sneakers, um, I realized that I was wearing plastics on my feet while cleaning plastic from our beaches. So. That is, that is how it started. And then I'm uh, very blessed to be a part of the Luxembourgish uh, startup ecosystem where I'm very supported by the uh, University of Luxembourg incubator. Uh, and that is where this uh, idea has grown to what it is today. And we're very excited, of course. Right, so your business idea is to make sneakers that are going to last longer that are going to be with us longer. And uh, tell me about how are they circular uh, in their concepts? Definitely. So it is about circular raw materials uh, and circular design. So, you know, at the beach, I was wearing around 30 different, you know, the sneakers that I was wearing, they were made from 30 different pieces. And if we're talking about materials, well, 15 to, to 17 mixed materials. So mainly plastic based. And that is uh, the reason why the sneakers um, are, they're you know, inferior when it comes to quality. They're not made for you to wear them for uh, many years. They're okay. made for you to wear them for, I think the average use period is between three uh, and 18 months. And that's, you know, that's the story behind <laughs> behind that kind of uh, that kind of product. So if we think about circular, we want to avoid um, unnecessary, I think of them as unnecessary pieces. So we want to keep it to few pieces and we want to keep it to pure raw materials. And when I say pure, I mean that they're 100%. Um, so for example, we work with Italian calf leather sourced as a byproduct from the Italian food industry. Uh, we work with natural rubber for the soles. We work with eco cotton laces and we have recycled cork for insoles. And, and then we have hemp thread, so waxed hemp thread. So, you know, we, we can count the raw materials on, on one hand. 
Wow. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's the key because then we can design the product to actually last for longer uh, because they hold, the products hold a higher quality, which also means that they are mendable. So we talk about the circular value hill. So we have the circular raw materials, the circular design, we have the circular production, and then we have um, selling the product. So we still need to sell the products, but once we have sold the products, we expect the consumer to have the product for years and years to come. Uh, on the circular value hill, there is a downhill side, and that is basically how can we keep this product in use for as long as possible? So we have a natural secondhand market because the product can live for longer than 18 months. We also have the refurbishment, meaning that we can mend the seekers. Um, so, so this is, you know, this is the background and it, this all comes from my research report uh, published by Circle Economy in, in 2016. So I, do, I don't have to go through the report no. over this call, but it's, that's, that's why it's circular. And I think that's also important when we say the okay. world's first circular sneakers, because we are the first fashion brand um, basing a business model and a product on, on this concept. Wow, that is really exciting. Um, I, when I hear you talk about that, I, there are so many uh, bells ringing in my head around how do you manage cost for something that is so new? How do you manage your raw material, uh, your, your, your procurement? How do, you, um, how do you even know how much time it's going to take you to get to market? So how do you do all of those things? So if I, if I look at it from my angle, uh, from project management uh, point of view, um, we call a project something unique, uh, which is time bound, so that has a, a beginning and an end, and you create either a service or a product, um, something which didn't exist before. So if I hear you talk about this, this is definitely new, this is definitely something that didn't exist before. Did you um, knowingly consider any uh, project management uh, techniques or or did you use any resources to help you manage this as a project or or, or how do you go about that that's a great question and and it took us two years you know from from starting to actually you know launching in in november 2020 so we have been i would say building relationships since day one uh, and to really build a team around this. Um, yeah, I mean, at the start, it was an initiative. Now it's, uh, it's a viable business. Yes. So it's about building a team from, yeah, right from the start. Uh, when it comes to practical tools, I would say, you know, I've turned to the internet of things mm -hmm. as one does. And we've been using something called Asana. Uh, yes. So that's uh, an online tool, um, but also Google Docs and, and spreadsheets to really put things on paper or digital papers, uh, because it's, you know, we get ideas and they, es they escape, right? <laughs> so it's okay. a matter of getting it down on paper and then to create that action plan straight away. So to be very direct, you know, I, I have the idea and then it's, it's, it's in a spreadsheet a, a few seconds later and then we get to it. So what I, what I wonder then is right from the beginning when you had this idea, was it very much like what you're talking to me about now or did it change a lot since you had your additional idea? This is what we call scope management, where you imagine, you know, you think about what is the work, what's the, the product I want to create, what's the work I want to do, and then you break it down, like you say in your Excel spreadsheet. You've got your, you make your plan. But did your scope actually change from the beginning until now, or has it stayed relatively stable? I would uh, say that it's uh, it has changed uh, okay. a lot. Um, yeah. <laughs> Did it, what, what made you change the scope of, of what you wanted to, to create? Was it external inputs? Was it in, internal insights, learnings? Uh... I, I would say it's, um, it's both. Um, it is about communication and to always communicate. Um, and when I say communicate, I always mean um, listen. So I do a lot of listening um 
and uh, I also speak, obviously. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, it, it's about scanning the field. You know, you have a product, you have an idea, you have to gather the feedback. That's your, that's your research. That's yeah. what you can turn to and, and base your assumptions on. But when it, when it comes to the seekers, I would say we're, you know, I, I want to see the sneaker for, you know, the hundred, uh, you know, years to come. Um, but in terms of the, the business scope, uh, looking back and also looking, you know, looking at my, my emails, I can see that we built an ecosystem. Uh, we have, you know, raw material, we have manufacturing, we have production. Uh, I've met some of the, uh, yeah, some of my best friends, you know, they're also startup founders and they're in sustainability and circularity and it's such a warm community. Mm. Um, so I would say we started with a pair of, of sneakers and right now what we're doing is that we're building an ecosystem. So we're building uh, our choice dot echo, the our choice ecosystem where we want consumers to connect uh, to their fashion items and to be able to understand and take ownership over their consumption. Because right now, so many, and I'm speaking about the 7 billion people on this planet, are in the hands of fast fashion brands and the linear economy. So 97% of the fashion industry is linear, even if we talk about sustainability and circularity. So we imagine our choice.echo as the go-to zone for circular products and circular fashion. So, you know, starting with the sneaker that has led us to, to an ecosystem and that is what we're working with today uh, going forward. So, so that will be our next step. So I'm excited to, to also share that today. That is great. That is, that is really insightful because it, it sounds to me like you're, you're creating an experience and, and uh, a, a mindset rather than a product. Yes, and I think it's, you know, it's also about a different generations and we can mm. see that the landscape has shifted so very quickly yes. um, during COVID. And I recently did a, uh, a, a, a guest lecture for the University of Namur on strategic marketing in the circular economy. And it's very clear that education is the new marketing, especially when we're talking about Gen Z and, uh, and millennials. So, yeah. So, so then that makes me think of another question, uh, Philip, if you're talking about, um, you, you seem to have an easier grip or, or be targeting um, the young generation, um, how do you go about engaging with stakeholders that are not part of that uh, population demographics? Um, or do you choose not to target them and to, you know, not invest time in them? That because that would be another choice as well. How do you engage with those type of stakeholders? I think um, age is is just a number. And when I look at, you know, our, yeah, again, that makes spread, me smile. <laughs> uh, again, our our spreadsheets. You know, I see uh, that we have customers and we have followers, you know, and they're between 15 and 85. Okay. So, you know, of course, I target everyone. Um, but, you know, I think there is, I think Gen Z and millennials, what they're doing is that they're also educating other generations. And with yeah. COVID, we see, you know, this accumulating change in the way we, we behave and the way we consume uh, marketing. So no, I think no one is buying, you know, the, uh, the hard sells that the big brands are, are trying to achieve with their greenwashing and with yeah. their, you know, very, um, well, I, I would say false marketing. So I was, I, I'd say people are a lot smarter these yeah, days. Yeah, and yeah. I would say we, we don't have um, a specific target, but we go to Gen Z and millennials uh, because we can see that that has got a, a ripple effect yeah, yeah. Um, and, and an, also an impact on other generations. So yeah, yeah, yeah. happy to be working with, with education. And I think education is something, you know, it, it's about lifelong learning. Um, yeah. Yeah, great. Great. So what I'm kind of hearing, I think, is that you are um, 
doing something that we, we typically call in, in change management, you call it, you know, you're going up, you're going after the influences, after the, the early adopters, and they're going to help you influence the other stakeholders and get on board a lot more, uh, you know, public and, and supporters for you. You summarized it beautifully. <laughs> Thank you. Um, going back again about your initial idea and how did you get it off the ground? How did you go about finding, I mean, typically in a, in a project, uh, I'm project advisor. So what I would tell a project manager if he has an idea is go and find a sponsor, go and find someone who's interested. And I'm not just talking monetary sponsor, I guess in your case, it was also a monetary sponsor, but I guess also within the incubators, you found sponsors. So, who helped you set it up? How, how did you, how did you experience that? that what did you find easy or what did you find hard in, in engaging with the supporting sponsors? That, that's a great question. So my, my brain is spinning and I think it's, you know, like I said, I'm a very, you know, hands-on, um, person. I think something and then I, I get to it. So I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a doer that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and when it comes to building this from, from scratch, I think it's, again, it's about listening to your, to your surrounding and to different stakeholders and to build that network. You know, the, the support that I've got okay. from, from the incubator and from, from others as well has been great. And uh, I think it's a matter of, of being in the, in the arena. If you know that you have knowledgeable people you need to, to interact with them because the idea will improve and perhaps even take on a different direction. But that being said, it's also very important to, to listen to yourself and to your gut feeling and to mm. your, I mean, I want to say listen to your heart. Uh, it's, a, it's a cliche maybe, but it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's your life and it's, you decide what's in there and what you want to be spending your yeah. time on so that that may be a bit existential for, for this question. But in terms of, uh, of network, uh, I'd say network is key. Um, mm -hmm. That's something that we've been you know, doing from, um, yeah, as of day one. Uh, when it comes to, uh, we're still pitching for investors. So this is all you know, funded by, by the founders um, so far. So I think in terms of not having money, I think that also makes you think differently. It makes you think about resources in a different way. It makes you think about time in a different way. So it's also about time management and, uh, and really you know, being on top of that and seeing how many hours you spend and on what. It, are you actually getting something out of, of your calls or the hours that you spend? And then to be quick and to, to reallocate the hours. So I, I hope that answers the question. Yes, and it and it provokes a lot more other questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, when when I again when I go back to um, project management lang language, something that is very um, top of mind of people at the moment is agile project management. And so we talk about working with uh, developing uh, smaller increments, you know, risk limiting the, the, the risk of putting money that you, like you just said, don't even have right at the start. Yeah. So can you tell me something about how you went about testing your idea or testing the business idea or anything around that without having money to be able to also do things like budget assessment and, and trying to find out what this beast is going to look like, what is it going to cost you, and is there even a market for it? You told me about listening to your stakeholders and yep. uh, grabbing feedback. Is there anything else that you did in terms of step-by-step -step creating something, even if it's just an idea, but maybe not a product, creating something and testing it on the public? Yeah, and that's a, that's a great, great question. Um, and I have a, a short and a long answer, but I think I can summarize it because it's a, it's a big one and it's an important one. And what I want to see, I want to see a lot more startups, especially in the, you know, in the fashion industry. And I want people to take their ideas and to execute them uh, because God knows we need them. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, you know, I, I still see 
um, everything as, you know, as a, as a test, you know, and I, I think of it, okay, this is a test and I need to try it. It might work, might not work. And then I can take it from there without money. It gets trickier, but it's also about applying the right business model. So from the start, we've been doing everything, you know, on, on digital demand. So we launched on a crowdfunding platform, um, a very successful Kickstarter campaign. Uh, we just finished our second crowdfunding uh, campaign, also successfully happy about that. Uh, but that is basically taking a photo of what you have uh, and then, you know, yeah, spreading that, you know, and, and, and putting that into the world and you gather feedback and the feedback is, you know, okay, are people buying what you put out there? If yes, okay. you keep on doing it. If no, well, okay. you have to, to rework, but I think working with uh, a digital business model and especially crowdfunding, I think that's a beautiful tool uh, because you can really try out the product or the, the idea that you have without having to invest in, in raw materials or in production. You, you do need a sample, but I've also seen examples where people are you know, doing mock-ups with amazing uh, uh, 3D uh, technology and you know, CADCOM and, and all of that. So uh, I hope that's a practical advice as well. Uh, very much, very much so, very much so. And I think it's going to lead me to, um, I guess, towards one of the last questions, which, which would be, um, if you had to coach or mentor somebody else who would like to have, you know, bring the next great idea to reality, where would you tell them to start and where would you tell them to be very mindful of, very, very careful with? Start and, and, and what to be careful of. So where to start and what to be careful about. Okay, so yeah, I, I would say start with yourself and look at your, so I'm, uh, um, yeah, soon a psychologist, I'm about to graduate, uh, but I would go, a uh, first step, go to yourself and my business is, it's driven by you know passion and, and yes. purpose and mm -hmm. without that I could never have done it so I would definitely you know my, my first advice is turn to yourself uh and I do lists like no one can read my lists because you know my my writing is uh <laughs> it's, yeah I can't even explain it but I do lists and drawings and whatever just to map out okay what what do you know what are my strengths what do I need to work on? What do I, what do I need help with? So, you know, start with yourself, uh, look at your resources. And I for sure can, you know, I can see if something is viable or not uh, by doing so. You know, if I have the resources, do I have the, do I have the, you know, am I, am I driven by this? You know, it's, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. this uh, mm -hmm. realistic if you like? And, you know, it doesn't have to be realistic, but it might be that you can put down, okay, yes but I need someone in IT or I need someone to, to help me build this app. Well, you know, fine. But as long as you know that you have the capacity to actually drive that process, to, to go out there, to network, to connect with different developers, for example. So, so go and get the resources that you don't have yourself. I mean, yeah. exactly. And I, and I think that's my, that's the second, that's the second thing, you know, the what I would say, find uh, the best people out there. Mm -hmm. no one is good at everything god knows i'm not and mm -hmm. i'm happy to tell my team that you know i'm certain things i'm great other things i'm not but it's up to me and it's it's the best tip to actually go for the experts so be ambitious and find people within your network who you think might be able to, to actually help you in terms of competencies yes but also in terms of their you know their if you want to call it soft skills, uh, you know, their, their ambition or, or their, their drivers or something, someone that you, that you get along with, someone who you feel energized by hanging out with. Because if, you, if you're going to do this, That's a good uh, tip. It, yeah, because if you're going to do this, man, you know, you're going to experience some pretty, you know, rough days and sleepless nights. And you need to build a team that is you know, that is reinforcing you and that is, you know, giving you that positive energy on, on the bad days. So, yeah. That is, that is a very valuable tip, I think, which I have personally never um, heard 
set out, spoken out so clearly, at least in my work environment, but in my own volunteering experience with PMI, I can only echo that. I could not do what I'm doing on top of my day job for PMI if it, were, if it weren't with, with great people that I really believe in and that I really can rely on. So I'm, I totally echo that. Yeah. Good. Um, Philip, thank you very much. I'm coming to the end of my uh, questions, but I am really seeing a lot of, you know, we often call it common sense. Um, things that we do in project management aren't all just from dusty books. I mean, it's, it's everything you've told me is about engaging with stakeholders, is about getting feedback, is about adapting your products. It's about, you know, being agile about your scope of work, getting the right skills around you, the right people around you, um, carefully managing the money that you have little of or none at all. And so finding other solutions to, to manage your costs. So I, I found this, uh, I found this amazing uh, to see how many parallels there are and it just confirms to me that PMI and project management has its place in sustainability projects. And it's, it is just simply the future. It's about how we're going to take everything to the next level and where we need to be. We just, like you said, COVID has so accelerated everything that we just don't have the choice anymore. So um, I am extremely happy to be able to share your drive and your energy and fantastic uh, projects with our audience of the chapter in Luxembourg. And um, if, I mean, this, this is gonna be, this is a great start of our first initiative around sustainability with you. So I'm really proud of that. And um, we'll be turning, by the way, to the incubator of the university uh, for more ideas and more initiatives and more articles for our regular column that will be coming out in our newsletter. So thank you very, very much. And I wish you all the best. And please do keep us updated on how you're doing, what your next big great idea is, or uh, whenever you consider this project finished, uh, do let us know. I'd love to you know, give also our audience an update on where you landed and uh, how your sneakers are doing. Definitely. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, yeah, I look forward to giving you an, an update on the Art Choice ecosystem. Um, so yeah, thank you. Great, great. Okay.